Welcome to Ear Biscuits. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at our individual tables of either dining or placed into your living room, Rhett, we are going to have another discussion because Ear Biscuits don't stop because we're in our homes. It's not that much no, different. No, it doesn't. Still working. Uh, Still working. You, 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 you think this is work? <laughs> I don't even have pants on. This is a nice um, outlet. Um, today, you know what? Today's going to be a positive outlet. Just like you can sit down and watch a movie and you can escape from the reality of what's going on. And there's, I mean, there's some good news. There's a lot of bad news. There's, a lot of, there's still a lot of troubling news. There's, there's things to be worried about. Um, but you can escape into a book, you can escape into a show, you can escape into a movie, and right now, you can escape into an Ear Biscuits about movies. Yeah, we're going to do one of our top 10 favorites episodes. We're doing top 10 favorite movies for each one of us personally, going through our list. Um, We've had fun with this before. What, what, What else did we do? We did TV shows. We did TV shows. Al- um, we also did game shows, like specifically. Yeah, yeah well, of course. Yeah. So uh, this and is a the tough one thing because this one's this very broad. That, well, I, I'll say a few things about it. It was incredibly difficult to make this list because, as I've said many t- times about my lists of favorites, is that I don't, I don't have like a favorite movie. Mm-hmm. I have like a collection of movies, and once I started trying to narrow it down to ten, I started feeling really bad about the ones that I was leaving off of the top 10. So I have a pretty long list of honorable mentions. I'm pretty sure you do as well. I have some honorable mentions. Um, The thing that, it's not that I had difficulty narrowing it down as much as I actually had difficulty accessing some. I was like, oh, I I remembered one that would be like high up on my list. And I'm like, I can't believe I almost forgot about this movie. It's been so long since I've seen it. But It's not just what we think are the best movies ever, but at least for me, I rank the movies that were most personally impactful, the movies that were most meaningful to me for a variety of reasons, which I think is kind of what we did with the television show thing as well. Yeah, it's more about, I mean, favorite doesn't necessarily mean best. Best. Right. Although... I would say the majority of the movies that ended up letting make the top 10 were the ones that with few exceptions, I, I still think these are just incredible. I, there's not yeah, a film, be film on this list these, that's these not an incredible film. Right. But it might not be that they're all 98% or above on Rotten Tomatoes. You know, that's that wasn't my criteria. But also the way that I kind of tried to access the memories, which I have a horrible memory unless I wrote something down, um, is... I went to lists of movies, right. you know, and so I'm... There's probably there might be something that you accessed th- through your memory that wouldn't have made like top 100. Yeah, I went to like top 100 all genres and like went through all of them to kind of like reaccess different movies. Yeah, I did. But there I could did be one that that's not on there. Uh, anyway, well, one of the things that I realized was I've fallen out of the habit of watching movies. I don't. Th- there's been different eras of movie watching, and I think it will become clear in my list as to when these movies meant the most to me, like when I first watched them and what com- what compels me to go back and watch them. Um, but, you know, as, as television has evolved, I find myself watching more television than movies at home um, and not going to the theater or going to theater for a different reason or going with different people, like with younger people. That type of thing has changed my movie-going habits. But in this current situation... If there's ever been an opportunity to go back and rewatch movies or to introduce, you know, your partner or your uh, your kids to movies that were special to you, now's a great time to that. We're we're looking to do that. Now we're just looking for opportunities to do things. And movies, they take a good chunk of time. So I I guess you can just consider this an entire recommendation episode as we go through these. Do you do you want to start? Let's get into it. Sure. Uh, of course, we're starting with number 10 and working our way to number one. And again, of course, I don't know your list and you don't know my list, so. Right. Uh, my number 10 favorite movie of all time 
is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Really? The good and the bad and the ugly? I mean, I own that movie on DVD, but I couldn't have even told you that you've watched it. What? Are you crazy? You have, you didn't watch it with me? I've wa- I've watched every every Clint Eastwood movie multiple times. Oh, not just like a, a fistful of dollars and a few dollars more and but yeah, all Clint I've Eastwood the, movies. The the dollars tri- trilogy which inc- incidentally um this movie is considered the third and final installment in that trilogy, even though it was basically just marketed as that because it was a it was a spaghetti western. It was an Italian produced and directed movie. Um, and the reason I, I, I love this, I wanted to have a I wanted first of all I wanted to have a western in there because it's, okay. I love I love the genre. Yeah, but this is the most I I'm actually surprised that it's at least not on your honorable mentions because this is the most iconic film score of all time That's in true. my mind. Yeah. So, uh, so Ennio Morricone, what, he basically, this is that class, like so, ma- so many things that you take for granted, both in film scores, but also in filmmaking, yeah. like, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know this soundtrack, even if you don't know that you know this soundtrack. I was trying to do it and with my hands. It, but- it sounds a little bit like what Link tried to do there. But it's like, wah, wah, wah. Yeah, and there's like whip sounds and stuff like it's, that. All that stuff that you just, the and, soundtrack and like is sounds. great. Like maybe top two or three movie soundtracks of all times, definitely. But the movie itself, you got to settle in because it's a different type well, of pacing. The first t- 10 and a half minutes, there is no dialogue. 10 and a half minutes of no dialogue. And the shots are inc- incredible. Like, there's all these shots of just eyeballs, and there's shots incredibly wide. The cinematography is absolutely amazing. I, I, so I did a little yeah. research um, and, and learned that Clint Eastwood was so frustrated with making this movie that he never worked with the director again because the director was so meticulous about, like, you see the final product and the way that all the, he, he worked the actors so hard to get all of these different shots that Clint Eastwood was like, I'm never working with this guy again. And people will kind of look down on the whole spaghetti western That's thing. Sergio which is, Leone. Weird, I can't yeah, remember Leone. his name. So I looked it up. Just a super weird time in filmmaking history and that all of a sudden they started making a bunch of westerns in Italy. And then like they were some, you know, like Spain was involved in some ways. And I don't know. I mean, the, also the whole thing is overdubbed. So if you go yeah. back and watch this, you're going to be like, what? Yeah, it, they ADR'd the entire movie and it's super obvious. But there's just something about all the elements that come together that just make it iconic for me. And the 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 face the three way face off scene at the end is pretty pretty memorable. If you can last that long, I, I, I think anybody. I mean, I understand that it's a certain taste, but for me, it's it's so iconic and it stands on its own, and it influenced so much of filmmaking yeah. from that point on. That it's just, I, I just I love it. I did own it. I actually might enjoy watching like. You know, the outlaw Jesse Wells or something like that, more as a movie. And then I love some of the like Unforgiven and later like 90s. So, so no other Western made your list? Uh, nope. Tombstone? No, Tombstone's not, not on the list. I thought Tombstone would be on your list. Okay. Um, my number 10 released in 2004. I, this is a movie that I'd forgotten about, but it, it, it popped up as I was doing some browsing. And I was like, I think this needs to go on my list. It barely made it, but here it is at number 10, Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, it, it's an honorable mention for me. Okay. It, it, got, it got close to making it on the list, for sure. Napoleon Dynamite, uh, Jared Hess movie, you know, he had, he had made a short film and then it... It, it, I think that's what was at Slam Dance, which was like the companion film festival to to Sundance, and like so. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. That then they turned it into a full length movie, and it was it was based on his experiences and growing up in Idaho, and like the llama that's in it is his his mom's or his grandma's llama um, because she really had one. And last night didn't have anything to do. And I was like, 
Lily and Lando and I were going we're going to watch something. I was like, let's watch watch a movie. I think you'll like Napoleon Dynamite. It's number ten on my list. I'd like for you to watch it. And of course, I hadn't watched it in a long time. It is it is so specifically strange, you know. And yeah, uh, and, it's and just, also innovative for its time too. It's delightful. So many people have have tried to do that really um, quirky thing, including Jared Hess himself has tried to recreate the magic uh, that he sort of found in Napoleon Dynamite, and that's been difficult for him to do. Well, because Nacho it, it, Libre. It was, I, I really love Nacho Libre. Yeah, I like that um, movie. My whole family had watched that. We may have watched it twice over the years. Jack Black is hilarious. It's it's a really good movie. So I would say it in 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 Lily and Lando's opinion is a much better movie than Napoleon Dynamite because at like ten or thirteen minutes in they they were like, Dad, is this the movie? Because they were like, is something going to happen? Because it's just these strange characters just being themselves, and there's not a lot that's really happening. There's, there, I mean, they they couldn't keep watching it. I had to turn it off, and we hadn't gotten you're, to any sort of question or conflict. You're kidding. Yeah, they weren't into it, and they love Nacho Libre. Watched, my kids have watched, my, first of all, my kids end up watching a lot of movies without me, like, Especially a lot. Like, I'll be like, hey, you, you, have you seen so-and-so classic movies? Like, oh, yeah. He just watches a bunch of stuff on his own. So, Napoleon really? Dynamite, k- kids have watched that. And they, they liked it. I'm a fan and of they weren't as Jared into Hess. It, it, um, as I was. But. Don Verdeen, biblical archaeologist. Then, then, well, I think the thing we like, like about Jared Hess is that he... he if, if we were to make movies... We've always thought, especially because at that time, like 2004, when that one came out, right. like we were thinking, we were trying to figure out what is this career going to look like and where is this eventually going to go? And I think we always assumed that it would end at making movies. And maybe it will, Link. Maybe it will one day. Right. But we, we had this vision that, oh, the way that he's kind of drawing on the weird, quirky stuff from the, his life and his childhood and the way that he puts that on screen in very specific ways. It's just how we imagined that we would always make. It was a different comedy. type of comedy. That's why it had to be on my list, I felt like, because it was so inspiring for me and for both of us because it was a, a specific strain of comedy that we had never experienced, that every choice was a comedic choice. And it came together in a way that was like, it was so odd that it became cool in spite of itself. E- even the... The, the music cues and like the composition, e- everything was just delightfully strange. And I think it gave us confidence that those instincts, comedic instincts that we had that were kind of kindred to his was something that people could dig. And yeah. I, I, it gave us more confidence to, to explore our comedic voice. So that's why I had to make the list for me. Okay, I'll pick up with number nine in one second. Uh, first, we do want to take a short break, let you know that we've got pop sockets, people. <laughs> we At mythical.com, you can go and pick up pop sockets. We've got the mythical pop socket. We've got the GMM pop socket. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up. Pr- prop up your I'm phone. Make it pop. Now, we don't have them on our phones right now because we're going to sell these. Check this out. I mean, it's very satisfying. The thing about a pop socket is that it's it's basically a, it's still the only f- acceptable form of a fidget toy. You know, it's kind of fartish, and it feels good. So again, kind of fartish. <laughs> mythical dot com. It didn't. The words mythical. Mythical not com. Didn't come out of my mouth exactly right. There's also a. We don't have our hands on it right now. There's a feel-good Mythical Morning pop socket. So every time you oh, look you know at what? your phone and hold on to it, it feels good. And you know what? It feels good to pop it. I did get that. Actually, I just remember I got one of those in the mail, I believe. And I'm in, uh, it's just in a package. Sorry, crew. Sorry, oh. Mythical crew who sent that to me on time. I don't have it. But it's, it feels good and it looks good. Go to mythical.com. We got all types of stuff, including pop sockets. We will... We will just, it, let's get popping. If you want to know what's popping, go to mythical.com. Okay, back to the list. We're to um, your number nine. 
if you've lost track already. Number nine, what I consider to be the perfect movie. Perfect movie, and it's only number nine? The Godfather. Okay, okay. I thought um, I thought that one of these would make your list. I mean, people okay, say Godfather this was Part difficult. Two is better. Uh, well, again, there's a I, I, there's another trilogy, as you might imagine, on my list. There's probably at least one on your list, um, and I just picked the first one from. I'm just picking the first movie from the trilogy, uh, and Godfather Two is incredible. Godfather Three is everybody sort of agrees is not as good, but um, I love a gangster movie. Uh, I absolutely, and, and so obviously The Godfather was Francis Ford Coppola, and then Scorsese kind of came in and has taken over the mantle of the the making the perfect gangster movie. Goodfellas, speaking of Scorsese, was almost took this spot on the list because Goodfellas is funnier than The Godfather, and I also think it's a perfect movie, by the way. Um, and it, it's sort of the modern gangster movie. But a lot of the same characters, it's just you have the addition of Joe Pesci. <laughs> uh, Were they playing the, the same characters? They're not playing the same no, characters. No, 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 no. No, but you I'm just saying same this. actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. De Niro. Um, you know, it's, so I love the epic sort of like sweeping, multi-generational nature of a really good gangster movie. And again, that's what they did in The Irishman where they kind of took him through his life and um, I just sit there and I just kind of just completely, I become engrossed with this. And I remember the first time I watched The Godfather, which I don't even remember how old I was, but I was a teenager. And I very rarely have gotten lost in something and just been like, because a lot of people are like, man, their movies are so long. Like a Scorsese movie and The Godfather, I don't know how long the, the first one is. They're all long. But like, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I could just take it. I could watch it. I could watch like a 12 hour version of it because everything about it is perfect. The writing, the acting, the score, the cinematography. I just don't think there's any misses at all. Although I was surprised to learn that Marlon Brando, uh, two things about him. He actually put cotton balls in his cheeks when he did his audition for the role. Uh huh. Uh, because he wanted his face to kind of look like a bulldog, more so than it already did. And then for the movie, they they had a dentist make like a prosthetic that goes in his mouth that like pushes his cheeks out and goes that that way he talked. Oh. Um, but he also he's such a weird dude. He didn't memorize any of his lines for the movie. He read them off cue cards. <laughs> Seriously. And so to learn that the lead actor in one of the best movies of all time wasn't really even acting <laughs> in the traditional sense. Wow. Uh, was, a li- was a little surprising, but... So you're saying that a gangster... Well, okay, you don't have to... But a gangster movie didn't make your top 10. No gangster movie. And, I, you know, I, th- I think a lot of people may be thinking, Link, you, you've got a, a reputation of being the guy who hasn't seen the movies. And you know what? That's true. Especially, like... All of the the movies that everybody's seen from the eighties, you know, which is why we made that Viewmaster thing for uh, the Mythical Society that put me in these movies I've never seen, like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen The Godfather. I've seen The Godfather Part Two. But there was a there was a stint in college where I realized I needed to go back and watch these movies because in, in my house growing up, we just didn't watch. We didn't rent that many movies or watch that many movies in your house. I just think it that was like a that was a big thing, right? And not yeah, that you all movies. watch them together, but you would also watch the movies on your own. But you rent those VHSs of The Godfather and watch that. So in college, I watched those. I watched you know Space Odyssey two thousand one. I you know I watched all the things that. Like the oh, hold on. So two thousand one didn't make your top ten. No, that was an honorable mention for me. I I was sure that that movie would make your t- top ten. I had that I had that kick where I took an intro to film class my sophomore year, and I really felt convicted to go back and watch the greatest movies of all time. And we would watch a lot of them together. And there was a really cool you know video store there where a lot of them you could rent for a dollar. Remember that? Mm, um, yeah. So, 
I watched them all so closely together that they didn't have a lasting personal impact. There are some from that time in my life, but it's, it says a lot more about me than it does about the movie. Um, so no, no, no gangster movies in my list. Um, okay, what is your number nine? My number nine is uh, from 2014. <laughs> I, I was making my list and I realized I didn't have a Marvel movie on my list. And mm -hmm. I feel like that if I'm going to see a movie now, like without exception, I go to the theater to see a Marvel movie because my entire family's into it. It's a way that we connect. We got a lot of really great memories around watching movies. We watched Infinity War. And when it was over, we had reservations for dinner and Lily was in tears and I was like emotionally ripped apart. And we, we didn't even go, we didn't even eat dinner. We just went home, you know? So I felt like I had, I, I had Marvel had to be represented on my, on my list somewhere. So at number nine, the only Marvel movie on my list Guardians of the Galaxy. That's my favorite Marvel movie. I mean, Infinity War, the first Avengers, like all, there's a lot of ones that are special, um, but Guardians is just my favorite. It's just, it's the funniest. It was so surprising because it, yeah, I wasn't, I'm not a comic book guy, so I wasn't really familiar with the characters. So I, my expectations were low, but then they were blown out of the water. And it just continues to deliver with every sequel. I can't wait for the next one. Yeah. I So Guardians of the Galaxy was on my original, just like my long list. I kind of, I, I, so I guess you could technically say it's on my uh, my honorable mentions, but it didn't really have a, it, I knew it wasn't going to make it into the top 10. Yeah. But it is, for me, as a guy who doesn't really like comic book movies, it is easily the best franchise marvel franchise for me and i think that's why it's on my list for the reasons it's, it's almost on your list yeah, plus all the because reasons i love marvel it, it, one of the things that happens in in marvel movies that is frustrating to me is just i'm just not the whole action thing is not it's not super appealing to me and like following a bunch of different like I like the Avengers and they're incredibly well done, but like just things get too complicated. It's not like it's difficult to follow what's happening in the Avengers. I'm not saying that it's not like Memento or something, but it's um, there's emotional investment it, it, in the entire. Uh, it gets a little too complicated and too complex for me to like yeah. find out what I'm supposed to attach to. But for Guardians okay. of the Galaxy, I attach. You know, I find that there's an emotional connection. The soundtrack. We play the soundtrack. It's the, by far the most played movie soundtrack in our house is Guardians of the Galaxy. It's going all the time uh, because, uh, it, you know, what Chris Pratt listens to in the yeah. movie, it, it's incredible and it's super funny. So, yeah, I, I definitely thought about it, but I just couldn't, I couldn't give it a top 10 spot. All right. So where are you at? Uh, number eight, I, I'm, almost, I'm positive this is not on your list unless you, unless you're, you got something that you've never told me. Um, the Wizard of Oz. Wow, really? Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. E easily. Okay. Easily. Um, and this for me is if you're if you're a forty two year old person or somewhere along those lines, you remember the Wizard of Oz coming on every single year on television. And for me, it was this incredibly special time, like getting by myself. And watching The Wizard of Oz was this almost spiritual experience. There's something absolutely magical about that story. I mean, it is recognized as one of the best movies of all time on most people's list, but that's not why I chose it. That's why I remembered it. But I was like, oh, yeah, Wizard of Oz. Like, I would, there's something about at such, at such an early time in sort of cinematic history, they were able to bring this fantasy world to life, and when you watch it, you can kind of see like, oh, I can kind of tell that they're just in sort of a big room, <laughs> and that castle is painted on a wall. But, but you can still tell that it it was flooring for anyone the first time they saw it. And even as as a kid, I can access that memory 
yeah. of the first time I saw it and still being transported there. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite things that, one of my favorite genres of literature and one of my favorite genres of movie is the our fantasy movies where there's a connection to the real world, right? So hmm. even though I don't like, um, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia is not on my list because I didn't really like the movies. I loved the books as a kid. Yeah. And the reason that the Chronicles of Narnia connected with me so much is because it actually established a connection between the real world in England with this fantasy world, as opposed to like Game of Thrones, which is just a fantasy, it's a world building fantasy thing, which is awesome. But the idea that you can actually find a thin place somewhere in the world and actually move into the fantasy world has been something that has been fascinating for me since I was a kid. And I remember like walking in the woods and like looking in trees and I was like, is this it? Is this how you get to the fantasy place? <laughs> and even though I know that she was technically just in a dream, which is unfortunate that that's how it, it ends. Um, spoiler alert. Um, just the idea that this girl from Kansas, the real world, with her little dog goes into this absolutely magical place that was represented in this incredible way. It's just, it's definitely, I almost put it higher on the list because it looms so large in my childhood. I got to say, now I, I do feel a little guilty for not putting it on my list because I, I remember that feeling of realizing it was coming on television again when I was a kid and being so excited. It was gripping. And it wasn't the type of thing that you you only watched half of it. When, once you were in it, you were in it. You were like, oh, this is a good part. This is a good part. And and for it to hold yeah. up that well is absolutely amazing. It's iconic, yeah. Okay, so my number eight is a Wes Anderson movie. Now, if I were to rank my favorite filmmakers, I think Wes Anderson may be my favorite filmmaker. He may take my number one spot. So it kind of, it, this was difficult for me that I had to narrow, I, I, I ended up- can I, guess, can I guess which one you chose? I had to put one on my list and I didn't put one higher than this. Um, yeah, you can guess. Okay, well, let me, before I guess, let me just say that I knew that a Wes Anderson film would be on your list. And a Wes Anderson film almost made it on my list because I don't like Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson as much as you do, but he is, he's definitely in my top five favorite filmmakers. However, none of his movies made the list for me. And the movie that I would, and was almost on my list at number 10 and almost knocked off the good, the bad, the ugly is one I'm sure is not on your list. You, I bet you'd say Fantastic Mr. Fox. No, I said Rushmore. Rushmore is great. And I was I was almost going to put that on for the kids last night, and then I realized it's rated R, and I didn't want Lando to watch it. Um, but So I think you chose. I think I you chose. I didn't choose Rushmore, but I thought about it. You either chose. I know you either chose The Royal Tenenbaums or The Life Aquatic, and I think you chose The Life Aquatic. You are right. <laughs> um, I saw... I wish I would have seen The Life Aquatic in theaters. I don't know why I didn't do that. It came out in 2004. Um, Rushmore came out in 1998. Tenenbaums came out um, closer to The Life Aquatic. Um, I think Tenenbaums was the first movie that I watched of Wes Anderson. And then I went back and watched the, the previous ones. It's a great movie, great acting. And it was, it's so striking. The, the the visual voice that he has, and it really resonates with me. I mean, it's not, not, not just the, the meticulous control that he applies to every single thing, just seeing his process when watching the movie, I delight in that. And I think that's something, it just makes me feel you know, it's like it's like a well-oiled machine or a well-cleaned room. You know, it resonates with me to see everything so perfectly symmetrical. And then the way that the, the comedy doesn't, the first time you watch it, you're like, is that, I find that funny, but is that supposed to be funny? And of yeah, course, he's, w once you understand his voice, you, you know it is. Yeah, but. it's a, the, well, that's, that's, why I, that's why he's one of my favorite filmmakers. I mean, ob obviously the aesthetic stuff that you're talking about, but... Uh, for me, it is the effortless comedy and the way, and also his casting is, is is better than anybody in terms of comedic casting. Knowing 
knowing who's going to be funny without trying. Gene he's a, Hackman he is a was master. amazing. He's a master at that. The reason why I chose Life Aquatic, even though some people will rank it really low on their Wes Anderson list, um, it was more whimsical. It was. It didn't have. There's a in a lot of Wes Anderson movies. There's an underpinning of sadness, and there's a lot of comedy that comes from that. I wouldn't call it dark comedy, but it's like sad comedy. Um, it, the Life Aquatic was kind of a, a refrain from that. It was a, it was it was more whimsical. It you know it was. I mean, Bill Murray's character was tapped into so much of what you get with Bill Murray that like it's it was he was very morose as a character, but it wasn't. I never felt sorry for him. I always felt I just thought it was hilarious, and exploring that world you know, with the cutaways of the ship and everything. It was just, it was just more fun throughout than Tenenbaum. So if I was going to sit down and rewatch it, I find my, I found myself going back to that one more often for, for those reasons. Yeah. I think the, re- I think the reason it didn't make my list is because I can, I appreciate all those things about Wes Anderson and I find it's incredibly enjoyable to watch his movies and you like everything about it. There's something you can keep finding that you are enjoying. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that it doesn't do for me is I don't get emotionally invested in his characters in the same way. However, the character I got most invested in is, you know, Schwartzman and uh, Rushmore, interestingly. Um, And so I think that that's why it was my favorite. But yeah, it's just more like, it's almost just like a a filmmaking, uh, it's just an experience in watching great filmmaking. It's like going to an me, amusement park. It's like going. I never forget that I'm watching a movie, though. I think that's the thing is I never forget that I'm watching a movie. If it draws the, attention that, that to makes, itself. That sounds strange, yeah. Yeah. Give me your number seven. Uh, okay. My number seven. Uh, again, I wonder when we're going to get some crossover because I don't think this is we're, we're there yet. Uh, number seven for me is The Princess Bride. Um. Again, this is uh, this is a lot of people's one of people a lot of people's favorite movie, um, and I again it was one of those that the first time I watched it I was just like if this is what movies are I this I want to make I want to make movies you know um, it has it's got that adventure quality but it's the Princess Bride for me is just the peak of sort of fantasy comedy mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't go all the way into like a Monty Python place that is just completely unhinged gets pretty close in a couple of places. But again, there's just something about the tone. First of all, I'm a huge Rob Reiner fan, uh, and he's done so many different things. And then once I read, uh, which I've recommended this book before, I recommend it again, but the As You Wish book. Yeah. Um, the audio book's great too. Yeah, it, audiobook's got a bunch of the cast talking, and it's got freaking Andre the Giant in it. <laughs> But again, I just I just love the way it came together. I love um, there's so many epic moments in it, and again, it's just the, it's, I just get lost in it. I I love the Princess Bride. I wish I would have seen it as a kid. I I don't know. I was deprived. You know, I saw it. I I don't think I saw it until after college, and it's just a different thing. And like I could see I could see the everything you're saying, but I couldn't fully experience it because it doesn't quite hold up if you're not accessing the first time you saw it when you're younger, I think. Yeah. Well, did you know that uh, the actor that they originally wanted to play, the giant, um, was not Andre the Giant. Fezzik is the is the giant's name. Mm-hmm. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, wow. <laughs> Was the first choice just not? And now, first of all, cute enough. Like Andre the Giant had this cuteness that made it work. Well, he also had this giantness that well, yeah. Schwarzenegger actually doesn't have. He's he's a he's ripped. He's but Conan he's not the a, Barbarian, an actual giant, which is on my yeah. list. Uh, but uh, yeah, because the the whole again, you got to read the book because well, not the book that it's based on. The you know the Princess Bride. By William Gold, a, a, a Goldman, Gold or Goldman. Anyway, I, I've never read the book, but the p- people said it was one of those things like, "Oh, you can't adapt this book," and they had tried many different times. 
kind of like, did you, I didn't even realize until recently their, their Dune, another book that they said could never be adapted is being, uh, it's being made into a film right now. I've heard that, but it's, uh, it's but, still it, but anyway, uh, it, it took 12 years, 12 years had passed between the time that they were talking about Arnold being Fezzik to when it actually happened because it took so long to get the film going. And by that time, Schwarzenegger was a, just a massive start. It would have been incredibly odd and weird for him yeah. to just play the giant. And so they got a pro wrestler to do it who ended up being, it's one of my favorite parts in any movie ever. My number seven movie is the first movie I ever remember seeing in the theater. I don't know if it actually was, but it probably was. This was 1984. So I was six. If I saw it late in the theater, maybe depending on when it landed, I could have been seven. My dad took me to see Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Mm -hmm. um, and in a recent episode, well, maybe months back, I, I, I did talk about how we watched all of the Indiana Jones movies with the kids, so I introduced them to them, and th they were enthralled as well. Now, y you could make the argument that Raiders of the Lost Ark um, is, a, is a better movie, um, I would I would make that argument, and that but, and Raiders of the Lost Ark is, is on my honorable but they, mentions, but they no, both no Indiana Jones made hold it. up. Big oh, they're time. great. Temple of Doom is a lot darker. Temple of Doom is not as funny, um, but it holds a special place because I don't know why my dad took me to see this movie. Um, it was rated PG, and then because because of the public reaction to the the darkness of Gremlins and Temple of Doom, Spielberg lobbied that they come up with a new rating, which w became PG-13, and they changed the rating of Temple of Doom to PG-13, one of the first movies that got that rating. So I just remember seeing the heart come out of that guy's chest and covering my eyes in the theater and being absolutely horrified, and it was amazing. Watching the movie <laughs> back, I couldn't believe how endlessly entertaining it was one scene to the next you're just thrown as he's he tumbles from one thing to the next and it's absolutely endless it seems like you 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 think it can't get better than this the action can't get more exciting than this and then it happens and it's i mean th there are some problems you know the there the cultural portrayals of uh you know, and then like there's the white savior thing. I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't have its, its problems, and I'm not I'm not defending those. But it holds a special place in my heart because it scared the crap out of me as a child, and my kids loved it when they watched it. It scared the crap out of Lando, and he loved it a few weeks yeah, ago. Well, so I d I definitely feel like. Like I said, Raiders of the Lost Ark was was very close to making my top ten. I, I kind of felt like I had to, I wanted to put a Spielberg movie in my top ten because that's that's how I ended up kind of approaching this list. In a lot of ways, it was like I started realizing the the, the filmmakers that I liked their their body of work the most, and I was like, okay, I'm going to give you one film. But I just I couldn't do it as much as I absolutely love the Indiana Jones franchise, and it does loom very large in my childhood. And you got I like just, the dinner scene where they're like eating the bugs and the monkey brains. Oh, I there's mean, so many iconic that's, scenes. That's, that's, that's GMM right there, man. It's like the thing that I was horrified by as a child is something that became a cornerstone of my career path. I've got a connection to this movie, man. Okay. Um, my number six is by, by far my most recent movie. Okay, I don't have I don't have my years in here. I should have done that, but this is just from a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, get out. Yeah, I, I I assume Get Out was a uh, was an honorable mention of mine. Like I knew you had to hit horror, and and I knew even independent from that, you had to hit Get Out because it's yeah, well, so yeah, pivotal so culturally. You might think, um, yeah, you would assume there'd be more horror on my. I like horror movies a lot, but uh, 
I mean, I enjoy watching them probably more than any movie because I just enjoy the idea of getting scared, especially in a group of people. And now Locke and I, every single Saturday night is horror movie night, and the two of us just go down into the uh, garage where we've got a, a television, and no one else will get scared because no one else can hear what's happening. But uh, we've watched a bunch of ridiculous horror movies. But anyway. Did you think about us, or is it clearly Get Out over us? Get Out's better than us, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean... I, there's so many things. I love everything about both movies. Uh, but Get Out was one of the most enjoyable movie-going experiences I've ever had. Like the first time I saw it in the theater. Um, I, I, was, I was feeling so many things all at once when I was watching it. The first thing I was feeling was, this is super scary. And it's like getting me. But this is super funny and like a... Like a really funny, like a, like a, like a, I'm laughing as much as I am kind of cringing mm-hmm. in, in fear. And then the whole time I'm thinking, Jordan Peele made this. You know, it's just like Jordan Peele of Key and Peele, comedy duo. This guy has gone and created this perfect movie. There was this, there was like a combination of fat, there was a, fascination but also like an an incredible jealousy (laughs) at the same time to just think dude this this guy went off and did this thing that man i mean like this is an incredible accomplishment for anyone but this dude that was just over here doing sketch comedy had this up his sleeve the whole time this is crazy um but yeah it's i mean it's one of my favorite movies obviously it's number six on my list but uh it just it. I think it it also re- sort of represented the cultural um, resurrection of horror, being a, bringing horror back into the mainstream yeah. in a really big way. A lot of people have seen a lot more horror movies, and horror movies are grossing a lot more money at the box office because of Get Out and what it kind of did for people getting like, oh, I get it. It's kind of like riding a roller coaster as opposed to it just being a bunch of horror fiends going in and watching people get slaughtered in a movie theater. Mm -hmm. Um, My number six is my favorite, well, I don't know. If you ask me what my favorite comedy is, it's weird because I have comedies higher than this one, but I think of this as more of my like, if I'm going to go with like, my the strictest version of comedy that I'm going to apply to something and then make that list, I think this is my number one. My favorite is straight up comedy. Released in 1998, The Big Lebowski. Um, wow. You, you thought this would be higher. Is your number six. That's my number six. Yep. You thought it would be well, higher. It's higher, it, it's higher on my list than it's on your list. Okay. Um, but so you thought that I liked the movie b- more than you. I thought that it would have, I, I thought that it might be your number one, honestly. Yeah. I mean, at, at certain points in my life it would be, but, um, there's other movies that just, they resonate, they have more meaning, they touch my life in a lot more areas. This just kind of touches my funny bone and my comedic sensibility, um, I really regret not seeing The Big Lebowski in theaters. Um, I think that was my introduction to the Coen brothers. Um, This was, again, I was taking this intro to film class, sophomore year in college. Uh, I was able to rent it because they were talking about it in class. And I was like, how have I not heard about this movie? It's absolutely hilarious. It's also very profane, and that's really edgy. Um, it was, I, I wrote, I had to write a paper about mise-en-scene, which is basically arranging scenery and props. And I, so I wrote a whole paper. I'm horrible at writing papers, but I had to watch the movie again and again and again in order to piece together this paper. So I got really acquainted with it, but it never got old. The the performances from uh, Jeff Bridges and uh, John Goodman are just, I feel like they're perfect. And then the ways that they interact and, you know, it was the first thing that I really started to notice because I don't watch a whole, I don't watch a lot of movies again and again and again. That's just not, 
that's just not me. But I, but in such a short span of time to do that and still enjoy it and start to appreciate the nuances of acting, I think for the first time, was another touch point for this movie. But it was just, it was just so funny and still is so funny. Yeah, I gotta say, to I'm, me. it's my number two. Wow. Yeah. When's the last time you watched it? Uh, it's been years. It's it, it's been years. And, I, and and I was talking to Locke about how we should watch it together. Um, but I do. I know that one of the things that people discover when they watch it, and again, Coen Brothers are some of my favorite filmmakers of all time. I I wanted th- them to have a spot, and this is my favorite Coen Brothers movie. Um, the reason that it it's well, a lot of people talk about the fact that nothing happens, and I was actually reading an interview with Joel Cohen who says, yeah, the plot is sort of secondary to the other things that are sort of going on in the piece. I think that if people get a little confused, it's not necessarily going to get in the way of them enjoying the movie. So, and this interview goes on to talk about how like the plot is like the fourth or fifth thing because there's there's an aesthetic quality to it. There's the characters, the the dialogue is incredible the situations i, I mean like yeah, the baseball it, bat to the car with the the homework under the seat you know it's well and i think that it yeah i i struggle between like my list is a combination of movies that do something to me personally as a uh just a movie watcher you know as an audience member and then there are movies that do something for me as an audience member and an aspiring artist and so mm-hmm. again when i watch something that the coen brothers make i think it has, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're a duo you know a duo that's known each other forever as being brothers and so i think that when we look at them we think a lot about our careers and you know uh, we both read the book about their sort of creative process years mm-hmm. ago um and there's just something aspir there's in, something inspirational and aspirational about them and their career and i feel like this is like the pinnacle of where everything came together in one movie for them. And so, again, it's the kind of thing that, and we, we always reference this. We talk, when, when we're de- developing characters for ourselves and some of the narrative stuff that we've done, we think about the dynamic. We use those three characters <laughs> uh, as points of reference uh, in a lot of the stuff that, that we create. Like, are you getting two good men here? Or is this, how bridges are you? Or how... Bushimi are you and is your character you know I think that there's just something about that trio of characters the dynamics incredible yeah my number two and I thought it was going to be your number one it's number number six wow okay I'm very I'm very interested to see where your list goes from this from here okay okay uh <clears throat> my number five is again I think it's a perfect movie back to the future Back to the Future. Love everything about this movie. Um, yeah, a lot of people say it's the perfect movie. Uh, you know, it, it's not the one where he goes to the future. That's a bummer. No. Well, a lot. Of, it's interesting because when I watched it, I, I thought to myself, I was like, man, this movie has everything that I want in a movie. Um, you know, it's got this sort of, reality bending nature that if you're going to make a movie you might as well do something mythical you know i i I always say that um something magical should happen so you got that sci-fi element it's incredibly funny um and of course all the choices that he makes are i I just think it's incredible the way that it progresses and but there's a lot of people who point out the fact that marty mcfly really doesn't grow or change which is a really unusual thing, which would normally happen in a movie, mm-hmm. is that it doesn't seem that he really learns anything. There's no like epiphany for him, really. But um, yeah, I, I just, I, w- I watched this fairly recently, like in the past five years, and it was when it hit me. I was like, man, I never, like I loved this movie growing up, but I just kind of, I lumped it together with a lot of other movies in that you know you got all the spielberg stuff and you and, and then 
Uh, Zemeckis, of course, did this one, but it's a very Spielberg-y type. A lot of people just think that Spielberg made it. Uh, I do think he was a producer on it, but uh, Zemeckis and then uh, Robert Gale wrote it together, which uh, this is a really interesting thing. I was reading about this. In a 2015 interview, Zemeckis maintained, uh, so he and he and Zemeck, Zemeckis and Gale own the rights to the distribution of the film. And and the rights for all sequels. And they say that both of them have agreed that no reboots will be made as long as they are alive. Huh. So don't, don't expect it's one of those things. And, and I love that because you know, they would screw it up. It, it's one of those things that they would, there's, there's movie studios that are chomping at the bit to remake this movie, knowing that it would do really well at the box office, but there, you just can't improve upon the original. This is just one of those cases. You usually can't, but this is just one of those cases that there's just something sacred about it. Yeah. It's the ultimate time travel movie. The And it's the ultimate miss on my part. You know, I think that that that, that movie, the fact that I didn't see that until college in its completion, maybe after college again, is just, I know that's mind-blowing, and it's just, you know... You were deprived. Uh, um, uh a childhood cut short or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're at my number five. Okay, so this is where I've placed the Star Wars trilogy, and I have made a choice of which one. But yeah, here, here we are at number five with The Empire Strikes Back. I mean, you can't argue... I don't think you can argue with that being the one that you would choose if you had to choose only one to watch or to rank as your number one of, um, you know, all nine of those. But I did actually, I'm just going to be honest, I did think a little bit about The Force Awakens because for me personally, it was, <laughs> you know, I, it, it was an opportunity to see it. I, I don't remember seeing, I think I can almost, I don't remember seeing Return of the Jedi in the theater. So it was the Force Awakens in the th that theater experience after having waited so long and then it being a shared experience with my kids and now Lily is my, my whole family but most for the most of all Lily is so into Star Wars to create that experience and have that with her is why the Force Awakens and it's just such a nostalgic movie cuz it's you, know, you can argue it's just a remake <laughs> of uh, A New Hope, but I love that one, but I'm still putting The Empire Strikes Back. I I wish I could have experienced that no, I am your father moment, you know, for the first time. I actually experienced it. That would have been amazing, but, you know, everybody, by Hold the on. time we watched it, we knew. I don't remember not knowing before I watched it. Oh, Oh yeah, I, I well, especially I assume, in the theater. I know, I, I, know I, I saw. I don't think I saw any of the first in the theater because I mean that was seventy seven, eighty, and eighty three, right? I think so. So, right? Yeah, I ended up watching all of those on VHS, and I've never been. I love. I, I I'm a I'm a fan of Star Wars, and I like the most recent. Um, I've been. I really enjoy all the the, the most recent ones, but um, yeah, it didn't even get. It just didn't make my honorable mention because another trilogy did, which I I have. I assume that another trilogy also made your list, which mm -hmm. I enjoy more, which we've talked about. But um, you don't have to yeah, you, I, listen. You don't have to apologize for not putting Star Wars on your list. No, no, you no. Just no have to, I, you no, just I'm have not, to endure the wrath of of all the Star Wars fans. I think. I think it's. I the thing I respect about Star Wars is what it is the mythology and sort of the the philosophy that goes into it and how it translates into so relatable and so you can use it in so many illustrations uh but the actual just sitting there and watching the movie especially the, the originals it just doesn't get me it doesn't get me enough to get into my my favorite movies but you know what does another movie that you're not going to be surprised it's on my list and i would bet anything that is not on your list Number four, Braveheart. 
Uh, Braveheart was an honorable mention for me. I, I remember we were both really into that in college. I remember you were really into the soundtrack. Like you own the oh, CD. I had the, sa- I had the soundtrack and played it in my room. Now, I don't know if it was something about the fact that I felt this like connection with William Wallace, even because you know I always thought I was Scottish, even though I'm more Irish. <laughs> but there's something. Uh, it's one of those movies where I get so again nothing about the movie appeals to me from the in, the aspirational filmmaker side. It's one of those movies that I'm just completely an audience member, and I am I get completely lost in the story. In every single thing about it, I just it, you feel like your heart is just like beating bigger and bigger throughout the movie, and then the the ending Ooh, of gosh. that movie. Oh, the gosh. ending of that movie is just like it's yeah. like the first time I remember like almost like weeping to the point of like shoulder convulsions in a <laughs> in a in a movie theater, and it, just something about the way it emotionally connected with me at that time in my life is, and I and I was just talking to the boys, we haven't watched it. Yeah, it's very intense. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know what? It's also very funny. There's funny Some moments very you really fu- funny care characters. about those characters. Um, and it's, it's just sort of a, it's a huge milestone kind of accomplishment in, in filmmaking and just like a, a, an epic, uh, the the scale of it and the intensity. I think it's one of the first movies where there was, they just made the decision to be like, hey, when we show people fighting, like it's going to be real. Like there's going to be like people, swords yeah. going into Thousands people. Thousands of people and, died because swords really yeah. went into people. <laughs> well, interestingly, one of the things I was looking at, um, it talked about how they had to reshoot a couple of the epic battle scenes because a few of the guys had on wristwatches and sunglasses <laughs> <laughs> and they and they would like see it and it that only seems like a myth because they could just go I in and dig it and like rotoscope it out but deserve to be flogged i mean at that point in front of everybody yeah 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 you will be killed pull their kilts up and just give them a nice fanny flogging butt flogging uh which brings me to my number 4 i Again, Braveheart was uh, an honorable mention, but I had to put Apocalypto at number four. What an amazing Mel Gibson movie. <laughs> Just you're, you're joking. <laughs> yeah. You remember that I movie? Say, I remember Mel yeah, Gibson. Yeah, it was good. It, it was decent. It, it was uh, very well, violent. I mean, Braveheart is very violent. But anyway, that's not my number four. My number four... I know I'm going to surprise you here. Uh, I'm throwing another Coen Brothers movie up there, and now you know what it is. Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou went mm. higher two spots than The Big Lebowski for me, um, released in 2000. I, I was a big Coen Brothers fan by this point, so I was determined I was going to see the, their next movie in theaters. And I remember just feeling... It was weird. I just had I had this connection to this movie the first time I saw it. Like, and I really think it had to do with the the type of comedy. It was like that old timey comedy and um like this like the southern humor and just the use of music. I really felt like it was a movie that we would have made. I don't know. It was yeah. Something I actually I I feel this was a complete miss on my part now that I'm thinking about it. Like I don't know why that in all the lists that I looked up to jog my memory, yeah. Oh Brother didn't didn't come up. Well, it um uh, it, it didn't win a lot it, of I, awards. Uh George Clooney won a Golden Globe for best comedy actor and I think I did I do think it won best comedy or musical. I don't uh, as a um and it won the Grammy Album of the Year. It won the freaking, the soundtrack won Album of the Year because it was. The soundtrack was incredible. Amazingly curated I mean, by T-Bone and, Burnett. And every but, song, every song was great. So, so yeah, the, the, the Southern the comedy, the, the, the way that the, the history and the way that music was such a part. Like at that point in my life, um, 
like, I mean, music's so important to me. And there's been different points when I thought I could, I could be a music historian, not because I know a lot of stuff, but because I, I could, I could see myself investing what it took to be that type of person. Um, and I felt like that's, it was kind of like watching, there was a documentary element to it. I felt like I was watching a Ken Burns documentary on, on, um, you know, country music uh in some aspects and it so it resonated with me on on all those levels and and then the comedy of it and the characters and it was just um and it was fun you know it wasn't too heavy so it yeah i like i, fun like I said four. i love it and i i don't i don't know where i would put it but it didn't even come into my mind in putting my list together and now i i started to think hmm, i think I, it would have made my top 10 had i and I realized it for all the reasons that you just explained. I demand a written apology to Ethan and okay. Joel Cohen. Uh, well, I put the Big Lebowski at number two, so. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, okay, number three. We're going to have some, we're going to have some crossover in the top three. We have to, I think. Uh, my number three, I had to pick one. I picked the first one, the Fellowship of the Ring, of Lord of the Rings. Uh, having recently watched the trilogy again, I I thought that the Return of the King was my favorite, but in rewatching it, they're actually in reverse order now. Number one is the best. Number two is the second best, and number three is the, is the third best. And in, they're all incredible. In rewatching it, I I was um, as we discussed a few weeks ago, just fully engrossed. We're still going through all of the DVD extras, which there's like reams of that, and like the kids are into that. Like I said. Um, in this particular rewatching, the two well, towers. What number was, was it favorite. for you? It is my number two. Oh, okay, here's the number two. It okay. is my, so number my number two. three. So it's not my. I, I uh, my, I'm not my number three or number one. Um, again, it, it's one of those things. Like like we said a couple weeks ago, you you realize. I mean, first of all, we read the books, and we were both big fans of the books. Uh, it's. You know, it's a completely different thing than the Chronicles of Narnia. The Chronicles of Narnia were probably my all-time favorite series because of when I was reading it, the age I was reading it. But it's for kids. Yeah, it's a kids' book. Um, whereas you pretty much have to be a teenager or older to really, I think, get into uh, the Lord of the Rings. I but didn't read the books, the books until just, the movie started coming out, but I read each book before the movie came out. Only time I've ever done that. Well, I Game of Thrones. I read all of the books before I watched any of that, and it's it only helped, especially yeah, especially because they were they were so reverent of the books when they made the movies. Um, and now, as I've already recommended, the extended versions. The, it, yeah, well, it's, it's the perfect. It. The, from a literary standpoint, it is the perfect fantasy series. It, it's been emulated, uh, but it, it's never been superseded. I don't think. And then, like you said, the the fidelity that the movie, the way that they translated the books into the films, the level of detail, the level of attention is, it's just something that I don't think it, it had never happened before and it hasn't happened since. No one's ever adapted something with that much care the way uh, the way that you can watch a superhero movie and i understand how someone might feel like you know what it's just a little ridiculous it's a bit too much for me i just can't get into it i think you could say that about lord of the rings if it wasn't lord of the rings but the fact that it was it is what it is it has such a deep um well of backstory and history um, and language and everything. It's 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 easy to just immerse yourself in that world and to because you can't be it. It's really hard to be critical of it because it's done so well. Whereas if it's not, you can just roll your eyes in that genre. That's what happened with Narnia, you know. Right. Um, okay, so my number three. I've been on record. I. You shouldn't be surprised. I've been on record saying this is the best movie of all time. And I it sounds like I'm saying it as a joke. 
I can't believe it made number three. My number three movie of all time, released in 2003, with no apologies from me, is Elf. (laughs) Elf is one of, is my third favorite movie of all time. You know, I didn't see it in the theater. It's sad that so many of my movies uh, on my list I didn't see in the theater. But we watch, of course we watch it every year at Christmas. And every year at Christmas, I'm like, I I forget how good this movie is. One of these years, I'm going to expect it to be as good as it actually is. Every scene, I mean, it taps into the nostalgia of of those old stop motion movie Christmas movies that we'd watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman Frosty the Snowman uh, it pays perfect homage to those it's it's Will Ferrell in this like super sweet mode that's just really winsome it, every scene it's like oh yeah this one's this is a really good scene and this is a really good scene and it's the scenes build the movie in some way it's kind of like I know that's like a weird or maybe obvious thing to say, but what I'm trying to get at is it's not just what, everything that happens, you feel like this is my favorite part of the movie. And then the next thing that happens, oh no, this is my favorite part of the movie. And you go through, there's only a few places where that's not really the case. Like every every scene has something that in that moment that you're watching, it makes you think, it's the best. It's like listening to the Hall & Oates Greatest Hits album when you're like, oh, this is their best song. And then the next one comes on. That's my experience in watching Elf. It's, and, and then there's, there's all the memories of watching it with my family every year and everybody's still loving it. Nobody rolling their eyes. Okay. It's a great movie. And when we do top 10 favorite Christmas movies of all time, it'll be my number one. <laughs> <laughs> But, hey, you don't have to say uh, anything. You don't have to say anything. No. No, I mean, I think it's funny. I th- it's a funny movie, but it's funnier that it's your number three favorite movie. John Favreau <laughs> wanted to, he, he was exploring making a sequel, but Will Ferrell didn't seem too into it. It's, it's come up a few times over the, over the decades, but it ain't going to happen. I don't think it should happen. I don't want it to happen. Okay, well, I've already told you my number two. I've already told you it's my the, number two, the, which is the Lord of the Rings. Oh, Oh, so we're going to number one. So well, now we, we obviously both, agree. W- yeah, we know what our number one is, right? <laughs> this was th- the this was the thing that there was no th- there was no question. The, I knew what I was going to put as my number one. It w- that wasn't the difficult part. The difficult part was filling the list out. But we'll say it on the count of three, and we'll say it at different times because of the delay between our two video chats. But three, two. One Pulp, Pulp Fiction. Fiction. <laughs> there it is. Released in 1994, uh, Quentin Tarantino's follow-up to Reservoir Dogs. When I watched this movie, I went to. It's interesting. We didn't watch this movie together. Um, it was, it was really gaining momentum. Uh, it had been out for a while, and. I went to the Rialto Theater, which is like in in Raleigh at like five points where that Th- like- That's where I, I saw it at the Rialto for the first time, but did I see it because you took me back to it? I think so. I, I know I didn't watch it the first time with you. I think I watched it with Missy, my girlfriend at the time. Because that was okay. 19, it might've been 95 by the time we saw it because it took a, a while to get going and- we were, I was de- we were definitely dating at the time. But the funny thing is, I don't remember who I saw it with. I remember the theater. I remember the theater had a stage, and it had these two big speakers just exposed and sitting out there below the screen. And it, it was a small theater, and you would just walk down the sides and then go into the middle. Really old, rickety, squeaky seats. And right at, it just felt... It was the first time I had seen a movie at the Rialto or any like art house theater, and I felt so out of place, yet so cool being there. You know, I was being in high school, and it was just like there were there were these hipster college kids and like these old guys wearing sweater, you know, cardigans, like professor types, and they were drinking beer in their seats and. It was, and then the movie started, 
And it was, and it started in, in, in such a different way than in a movie I'd seen. It had this opening title credit sequence. I'm like, what is this? Yeah. Well, he did. He, I remember the feeling of after I watched that movie, and this has happened a few times where you just got to just sit there for a while. You can't get up. Well, it was confusing um, because it, it was, you know, it was a, it was circular narrative. It was presented out of order, and so like, well, it, it, he was just he was doing things that we had never been exposed to. First of all, we hadn't really seen anything that violent, you know, uh, in your in your face. Like, I mean, the type of violence, gr- gratuitous, gratuitous violence to the point. And again, this is controversial. Tarantino is controversial. There's going to be people who are mad at us because we put this as the number one. But listen, this isn't. We're not trying to please anybody with this list. We're just telling you what our favorite movies are. And I know Tarantino is a controversial figure. Uh, but the impact that that movie had on me and the fact that it he made extreme violence funny. And I don't know. I know that that's, that's problematic. And I, fi- and I find that problematic. And I wouldn't personally create it. But even the, the scene where... They shoot Marvin, and it's actually the most horrific thing that you can imagine, but yet incredibly funny at the same time. He Tarantino had this way of tapping into this sort of dark part of every person who wants to laugh at violence because they don't know well, how the, to compute it. The thing that was funny was the char- it was. In those characters' worlds, it was just another day at the office, and it and so it's it was the most honest way for those characters to react to that accident, um, and it was funny. Like I mean, the dialogue. The dialogue is it, it's unlike anything we, we had never ex- experienced. That like the Royale with cheese conversation that they have in the car in the first half of the movie. I remember us talking about that and thinking like it. No one's ever, no yeah. one's ever, we, we had never been exposed to anybody who would have this completely tertiary conversation. We would have weird conversations. Extended. It felt right. like there was, there was a resonance in the fact that time was dedicated to two characters having this strange conversation. And it's not moving anything along. That, and it really, except that it, because they were walking up and they were armed, it's, you know, depending on what, you know, they were going to do something. All this tension was built because There's it's tension. like, what? what's happening? I find this extremely funny, but it's also, I'm really tightening up inside. And it was, and I was aware of the filmmaking process more so in, than I ever had been, maybe completely for the first time that like, a director's voice could 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 move me, and it so that was extremely inspiring to to make a connection between a de- decisions that a director had made and the 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 experience that I was having. Um, yeah, well, and, and another part of that that I think you'll agree with is when we made movies. You know, like when we made uh, Gutless Wonders or whatever, and some of the stuff that we would start filming and writing at the same time growing up, the, we didn't think about film scores as scoring, right? We didn't think about people making music that is intended to accompany. In our minds, the way that we thought about film scores was soundtracks. We thought about yeah. songs that were cool, that had a vibe that you put into a certain part of the movie. And that's what Tarantino did in that movie, that soundtrack introduced me to genres of music. I mean, that soundtrack introduced me to Al Green. Yeah. And, and from then on, it's like, oh, I'm an Al Green fan, you know? And, and every single song was so carefully chosen. And I think that that resonated with us because the way that we think about music and the way we think about, uh, music being matched to something on screen and he was he continues to be a master at that but that was something we even though it had been done it hadn't been done in nearly the same way and the fact that i mean it, it, 
basically, if you if you if you're reading about cinema and you're reading about this movie, you're going to read about Pulp Fiction being a cultural watershed, whether you whether you like it or not. So, it, I think it was so special to both of us and became our number one because we experienced personally firsthand in that moment the cultural watershed, not just for film, but it it impacted so much more. Um, and it, to be at the age where it, that, that watershed could happen through, it could run through our body, just course through our veins as we watch this thing. I, I didn't know but I, that I was the one that brought you to watch the movie again, but I can definitely believe that to be the case because I, having experienced it, I knew that you had to experience it. And I'm glad that we both went back there. I just don't think it was running anywhere else anyway. Or maybe it was just the coolest place to see it. Because um, it was still, it was, you know, it had 250, 265 F words, which set the record by a long shot. I'm for sure that Lebowski year, beat that uh, four years well, later. Well, but. but the highest, uh, Tarantino's highest number of F words is 269. Do you know what that was? Uh, Inglorious Bastards? No, it was Reservoir Dogs. So he oh. actually used to use the F word more <laughs> oh. than uh, than he does now. But um, yeah, I think it was the, it was one of those things that, interestingly, even though uh, you know me and you come from a conservative Christian background, and we were definitely like very serious Christians at the time. Uh, we never really, we didn't have a, an, a, an a, there's a big aversion to cursing and violence and that kind of thing. And, you know, the whole like Tipper Gore put parental advisory, there's a big aversion to a mm. lot of that at that time, especially in the, in the 90s. Um, but we never were really a part of that. We, we always kind of gravitated towards those things that seemed a little bit subversive, maybe because our personal lives were not, there was nothing subversive about any of the things that we were actually doing. Uh, so maybe it was somewhat of a, an outlet for us or whatever. But I think that that is one of the reasons that um, it it was controversial at the time. It's like, you can't do that. You can't say, who, why would you use the F word 265 times in a movie? Mm -hmm. And you know what? It is excessive. <laughs> um but it's almost like that's why he did it because it was excessive. That's why the there's scenes in there that are like, why did you have to put that in there? And it's like exactly because he was like, I'm just gonna I'm gonna do this almost as a as a way to sort of shock you into welcoming my style of filmmaking for better or worse. Well, there's but and I, the, there's I, more controversial choices than that, which we want. I don't want to get into, but um, oh yeah. Yeah, I, I and I, I think it, it was a time and a place, and being a part of that experience um, puts it at number one. And you know what? The what I hate to go back to Elf. I got to go back to Elf if I may, because I left out one thing that I that I found. You know the the burp where he like drinks the whole two liter of Coke, and then he like does the longest burp ever, and he's like, "Did you hear that?" <laughs> so funny, right? Great movie. Yeah. Um, it was a real burp, and it was from a voiceover artist named Maurice Lamarche, who was the voice for one of my favorite animated characters who made my, my TV movie list in that episode. He was the voice of the brain in Pinky and the Brain and Animaniacs. Oh, wow. <sighs> he did the burp for Elf. Well, you know, one, one additional piece of trivia uh, about Elf is... There was one word that was also used 265 times in that movie. It was the elf word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so um, there you have it. That's each of I our top resist. tens. I couldn't not, resist. Not as much overlap as I thought might could happen. And, um, you know, it's... Hold, so hold on. So you had, obviously, we had the same number one, and then we both had the Big Lebowski, both had Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah. Uh, and was that it? I think that's it. My honorable mentions were Toy Story 2, uh, Her, The Peanut Butter Falcon, uh, Forrest Gump, 
and the other ones that I already mentioned. Uh, yeah, let me quickly run through mine. Those are good ones that you just mentioned. Uh, Groundhog Day, Rushmore, Dead Poet Society, The Usual Suspects, The Matrix, Fargo, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Apocalypse Now, oh. Forrest Gump, Raiders of the Lost Ark, 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Shawshank Redemption, Ooh, Cabin yeah. in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods, yeah. which I'm going to be talking about on a uh, another YouTube channel. Uh, Toy Story and then Napoleon Dynamite. You're going on who, whose channel? I'm going on Dead Meat James. Okay. I don't know when that's coming out, but uh, you, you talk about your favorite horror movie. Uh, and Get Out was too obvious of a choice. So I'm talking about uh, Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, there you have it, our honorable mentions as well as our top tens. I'm not going to give another rec because this whole episode is a rec. Pick some of those to watch with your your loved ones and maybe we jogged your memory to go back. Hashtag Ear Biscuits, let us know. Just don't watch Pulp Fiction with your family. Yeah. <laughs> Unless your family is all adults. Right. Even then it'll get awkward. Hashtag Ear Biscuits, let us know. Uh, you can put your top ten. Uh, just tweet it at us. We'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah. Tweet your top 10. We'll tell you if you're right or wrong. And we'll speak at you next week. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.